Welcome to the month of the mutants. Thanks, and welcome also to Become the Teapot. I'm Ian. And so am I. And as promised, we will be starting the new year with X Month. Yes, the month of January is going to be dedicated entirely to Marvel's Merry Mutants. Don't worry though, we'll still be discussing a film and a related comic book. The only difference is a 300% spike in Hugh Jackman. Well, that's not quite true. There will be a couple of other changes along the way to celebrate X Month, but we'll discover those as we go. First up, we'll be discussing the year 2000's X-Men, which is not great for this podcast because it's not based on any particular comic. So instead, I'm giving Ian a crash course in X-Men history with Ed Pisker's X-Men Grand Design from 2018. A retelling of the early days of the team, the comic packs an extraordinary amount into its slim episodes. But don't worry, there won't be an exam. Exam. X am like X Men, but like a test. <clears throat> so, as you've already said, this episode's film is X Men One from two thousand. It is indeed. I mean, I've not seen this film in years. I think it is an excellent film. And don't pardon the pun. What, uh-huh. did, you, uh, <laughs> what did you think of it? Yeah, no, I like it as well. Um, watching it yesterday, I was surprised by how well it held up. Mm. Not some of the budget constraints and CGI, clearly. But generally <laughs> speaking, as a film, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it again after all this time. Certainly, it holds up a lot better than Fantastic Four 2 or Green Lantern. Yeah, I think they sort of knew what they were going to do on this film. It was The storyline was probably ironed out a lot more. Well, I think it was in development for years and years and years. So I think this is probably the 10th iteration of the script and and as such you know a lot of those things get hammered out in fact it was written by solid snake did you know that no david hater the voice the the voice actor (laughs) yeah that he's credited on the script but yeah no i i really enjoyed it i also really enjoyed the fact that it didn't seem to be setting up for anything i think we get a bit complacent with things like the marvel cinematic universe and the new dc universe where they're always building up for something, always introducing characters for a later film. Whereas mm-hmm. this was just truly sort of standalone, yeah. one story, one and done. Yeah, okay, it op- left it open for a sequel, but it was quite refreshing to watch. Yeah, I do like as well the opening. There's something that I love about a good Patrick Stewart soothing introductory monologue. It's not the first time you've mentioned it in the podcast, is it? So Yeah, I know. But, you know, it feels like a proper X-Men film. Yeah, I like... Wow. Well, I quite like the intro uh, monologues. I think the one about came about halfway through the film where he's introducing this school to Logan felt a bit expositionary, but yeah, and that almost felt like uh, something that was done in the edit afterwards where they thought, oh, we need to explain what this school is a little more, which I don't think you really do, but you know, someone clearly thought you did. Well, it is the first or one of the first superhero films. So at the time it came out, maybe the audience weren't too affe with this Mm -hmm. type of thing yeah and i think it does a a good job of that despite what are obviously some budget restraints you know Mm -hmm. some of the fight scenes which are just in sort of pub car parks and snowy roads and things like that (laughs) um they're not quite as grand as you get these days what did you think of the first scene that we get it's quite dark isn't it yeah i wrote this down the film begins with an energetic cgi opening smash cut to auschwitz then we have the scene with magneto being dragged away yeah then we cut to the future or the not too distant future and we have rogue's origin of her nearly killing her boyfriend yeah the first 10 minutes of this film is depressing as hell (laughs) (laughs) i mean the first scene there it's quite a dark colour palette, pretty much in black and white. Apart from, the Star of David is quite a prominent yellow colour. Oh, right. Uh, which I think that could sort of be a symbol of hope. I'll be honest, it wasn't pointed out by me. That's something that Kate said last night. Yeah, and I think Brian Singer is an unashamed fanboy of Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think his production company is called Bad Hat Harry, which is a, a line from Jaws. But yeah, I mean, obviously that is reminiscent of Schindler's List, where you have the red coat as a standard out color against a black and white palette yeah um like you say it wasn't quite black and white but it was a very toned down palette mm-hmm. but yeah can you imagine when this first came out obviously as said there's not that many mm. 
superhero films out and you think, yeah, let's go see the X-Men, you know, I love the cartoons, I love the comics. And then the opening scene starts and you're like, wait, what, what the hell? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what they were trying to do was make it more serious for a, a mainstream audience who were expecting to go in to see a sort of fun, flouncy kids comic book film, mm. which we've sort of almost gone back to now. We're sort of less ashamed of the bright colours and quips. But I think at the time there was quite a lot of stigma around that as an idea, so they wanted to make it seem less superhero-y and more action film. That goes through to things like, you know, the costumes from the comics are non-existent and they all have these sort of black leather motorcycle uniforms yeah very true very very toned down you know the action's still there the characters are still there but yeah they're kind of ashamed or they don't want to go into it too much where now you can have someone flying around in a, a suit and it's fine yeah no one bats an eyelid when you like, see at the end of endgame where four thousand different superheroes walk on screen through various portals all wearing different outlandish outfits and then the whole audience cheers yeah exactly but yeah i think they were definitely trying to make it more action film rather than superhero film despite the fact they did have superpowers you do get the opening scene of Eric and Rogue. Yeah. When it goes into the government speech, you know, that's the first time that we see Charles. Yeah. And we see him talking to Eric. Mm -hmm. What were your sort of takes on first seeing those two characters? Well, what I didn't remember was the accents. <laughs> yeah, I, I pointed out to Haley, and it annoyed her for the rest of the film, how in this one they're doing sort of transatlantic accents. So both Charles and Magneto are doing this halfway between American and British accent. And it bugs the hell out of me. And I, they almost completely <laughs> drop it for the later films. And then going back and watching this, I went, oh yeah, they were doing weird American drawls half the time, but then forgetting about it for some scenes. You know, Magneto's is better than Charles's, but it's just very distracting. And it's kind of the same thing they did with Halle Berry's Storm accent, where she sort of has a, a yeah. rubbish African accent, generic African accent, that they then completely drop for the sequels. Yeah. I mean, that first bit when... Charles and Eric do have their first talk. It's a very clever use of lighting because for most of that talk, you've got Charles in full light mm -hmm. and you've got Eric pretty much hidden within the shadows. It's subtle as a brick, isn't it? Well, yeah. Symbolising his dark motivations. You know, it's a very much bad versus evil. Well, that's, that's reminiscent in the chess games they have and things like that. I think one of the things the comics do particularly well is showing that Magneto has some valid points. He's not an evil character, despite the fact that he causes Brotherhood the brotherhood of evil mutants but you know he has a political ideology yeah so uh, yeah i mean i don't think it's that subtle i think it's quite on the nose as are the chess games but yeah i like that dynamic between them and another dynamic i actually really liked is the scott summers moments with charles xavier mm. but it's a shame that they make up about 30 seconds of the film <laughs> they got these really nice little glimpses of their sort of father-son or mentor-mentee relationship and it's just then completely thrown away in favour of another shot of Wolverine riding on a motorbike. <laughs> yeah. I do like how strong of a character he is in this. And I'm, I'm not just talking about his powers. Yeah. The fact that when Gene's doing the speech and then Senator Kelly comes in and starts going off on one saying, we've got this girl and that girl and these people can do these powers and all sorts. Charles, as a mutant, could stop him from doing that. Yeah. But he chooses to not so it shows good control and good intentions and not just to control people yeah and i think part of the portrayal of charles xavier in this film is because patrick stewart was probably the most famous cast member at the time yeah i don't think any of them were particularly big names they'd all been in things obviously but you know this is pre lord of the rings and obviously hugh jackman this is his sort of big break so not he wasn't a star yeah uh, and i think actually that works to the film's favor i think the more famous hugh jackman became the more the film's focused around him mm -hmm. and as such the other characters had less to do now admittedly scott and aurora have not a huge amount to do in this film but i still think there's a more of a balance and each character is given a little moment to shine which you definitely don't get in some of the later films i think it does a really good job of portraying the characters as i think that they should be and to introduce everyone all in one go yeah I don't think it's too crammed. I don't think it's too fast-paced. There are some characters that don't get enough of a limelight, mm -hmm. but it, it works. Definitely. And I think that's part of the fact that you have a, a slightly tighter cast you have a you know only four main x-men in the film and then obviously a bunch of ancillaries you only have four main brotherhood characters in the film mm -hmm. uh, and then you have magneto and professor x uh, and senator kelly you know so you have quite a tight cast yeah and as such 
you get a bit more time to spend on each of them and just showcasing what they can do and who they are. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the cast, I think the characters they chose are interesting. From what I understand, there were a lot of iterations of this script and a lot of different characters were in there at one point. Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, and Beast. And in fact, Beast was in most versions of the script and was removed for the final film. And basically his role just given to Jean Grey, which is why she's a doctor in this film, despite never being in the comic books. Yeah, we spoke about this off air, haven't we? Mm. I don't quite get why she's the one doing all the medical and bits. Are you are you trained in this? In the film universe, yes, she is. They describe her as Dr. Jean Grey, but that is a fabrication for the films. Apparently, they just gave her Beast's role and just went, right, well, we, need a, we still need a doctor. We'll just yeah, make Jean uh, Grey the doctor. I mean, it doesn't interfere too much with the plot, but obviously it's quite a big sort of character change from the comics. It is, yeah. I mean, it gives her a bit more to do in the mansion scenes, you mm-hmm. know, back at the back at home, which I feel is where Storm is really sort of short shafted. That's where she hasn't really got anything to do. And in fact, her biggest significance back at the, the X Mansion is when she's in the Med Bay looking after Senator Kelly. So almost that doctor role as well. Which <laughs> so it's kind of that. Yeah, but it just to me that bit seemed like he was on the table, sensed that he would die, mm. and he kind of goes, "Is, is anyone there?" And then she's like, yeah, I'm here. So it just happens that she's just walked past. I think they were having in turns looking after him, weren't they? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> We've touched him already with Logan. Mm. What were your thoughts of Hugh Jackman? So if you sort of cast your mind back to when you first saw this, did you think that's not right? That is right, I... you know? like Hugh Jackman as Wolverine in this film a lot more than I like him in subsequent films. I like him in X-Men 2 as well, which we'll discuss next week, but I think the more leading man he became, the less interesting he became. He is a lot more animalistic in this. Mm -hmm. He's a lot more like Wolverine from the comics, you know, antisocial. He he, he misses charming and lands firmly in the creepy category when it comes to his flirting technique, I would say. (laughs) I assume you're talking about Jean Grey, not Rogue. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. He basically he spends the whole time insulting her boyfriend to her face mm. when he had done nothing wrong yep. and then saying oh you'd like it better in here with me and she just sort of smiles and leaves the room every time he does it and then he does it again he's like mate you get the hint <laughs> stop it yeah he's really sort of creepy full-on flirting you know that late 90s flirting you got in a lot of action films <laughs> um but no, I, I generally think he's a lot better character in this than he is when he, they sort of try to make him into the all-rounder. They try to make him the leader and mm-hmm. the leading man and the action hero and the emotional support and the romantic lead. You know, especially Last Stand, where they basically kill off every ancillary character in order to have Wolverine fill that role. Yeah. I think he's a lot more like his comic book counterpart in this film. Mm-hmm. What about you? Yeah. I really like him, actually. Something that I did point out to Kate very early on when we were watching the film is that he doesn't look unfit. He looks like a guy that would go to the gym, but then when you compare that to later films, when he's, like, proper ripped and got, like, a nine-pack or something stupid, she was saying to me that she can't now not see that. Yeah. You know, he's he's not chubby at all. He's quite well built oh no he's massively turned he was cast for this film quite late they had to recast the original actor because he got tied up on mission impossible 2 of all films tom cruise (laughs) no not tom cruise do gray scott he got tied up on uh, mission impossible 2 so couldn't do this so they recast him at the last moment with hugh jackman and as such hugh jackman wasn't really coming into this with the superhero physique Mm -hmm. and i don't think that even really existed at the time so he looks like a strong man yeah not a man who spends eight hours in the gym four times a day and surely (laughs) ingesting chicken breasts and pasta and whatever they do i prefer this physique you know the first time you meet logan he's in a bar drinking and smoking yeah he's not meant to be working out i know that he's got this sort of regenerative ability so you could say that maybe that affects his muscles and it means he doesn't have to work out but it's very strange how muscular he gets that wouldn't necessarily think, make him a six-pack <laughs> no this is it so you would think a man who is literally bar crawling and drinking and smoking his way around the place you know in the back streets in his van shouldn't be a bloody body builder as well <laughs> well you obviously commented there about that bar scene the scene just before is the cage fight yeah and i do like that introduction you know it's the whole like come into the cage see how long you can last for but you can really feel those hits 
There was a weird metallic sound on every hit, which doesn't actually make sense when you think about it. It's clink noise. And yeah, but the, the other man isn't made of metal. And in fact, yeah, almost Wolverine's bones are completely wrapped in flesh. So Yeah, okay. I now see, yeah. That doesn't make any sense. There is a bit where he clicks his neck and there's a grinding noise. That would make sense. I guess. But I do like that they've added the effects t- so you can feel the fight and you kind of feel that that guy has definitely been punched and definitely in pain. Yeah. In fact, I think a lot of the fight scenes, even though they were a bit scrappy at times, I was surprised by how violent this film actually was and how, how you see people being cut or being stabbed or bleeding from the head and things like that. And it's just something you don't really see much in modern superhero films. They tend to cut away from that mm. or cut around it. Or there's no blood or bits like that. Yeah, there's definitely a more violent aspect to these. I think it's, it's a nice change of pace. It gives them a, an identity of their own. It, it's just making them a little bit more uh, gritty. Yeah, uh, but not in a sort of Zack Snyder way. <laughs> Something that I did like is the jacket that Wolverine wears. Yeah, I was thinking if only there was a film that would explain where he got that from. <laughs> I know it was a question I was asking myself every time it was on screen. It was very distracting. I thought he's got a lovely jacket, but where? Where did this poor man? Who this man doesn't even have a room. He doesn't have a house. How can he he's afford a such a nice trailer. jacket? <laughs> Um, one sort of last point then about Wolverine is his claws. Yep. So there are really good bits in this film that they do look real. Like one of the early on bits when the middle one comes out very slowly towards the guy's neck looks really good. But then literally seconds later, same scene and they look horrible. Yeah. And some of them you can tell that it's a prop he's holding tucked between his hands and some of them you can tell it's really dodgy CGI. Yeah, I mean, I'll give it a pass. It was made in the late 90s, came out in 2000. So, you know, there's been a lot of technological advancements since then. You know, what I can't give a pass, though, is some of the dialogue choices. (laughs) Um, Go on. I I know that I know what you're going to say. Well, no, I don't think you do, because I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to say the line I hate more than that is the yellow spandex line. Yeah. Because it, Quite cheesy, it, it? makes no sense. It may, Why would Cyclops at that point go, what would you prefer, yellow spandex? And everyone in the plane doesn't go, what the fuck are you talking about, Cyclops? Yellow? Why would he prefer spandex? yellow spandex? <laughs> what? He says, "We w- would you go out in this and you say yellow spandex? No, he's saying he wants to wear jeans and a t-shirt. I mean, <laughs> what? And that cool jacket. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any sense in context, apart from as a knowing wink to the audience and going, hey, whereas every character should have turned around and gone, what? Just fly the damn jet. But I think I know which line you're going to say. So what? what's your favourite line of the film? Well, I definitely would not say favourite. But yeah, I mean, Storm and Toad. What the hell happened there, you know? So I know what happened there, if it helps. And I can tell you. Well, First of all, the actual line, she asks him what happens to a toad when it gets struck by lightning. Yeah. And there's, there's an awkward pause. And then she goes, same thing that happens to everything else. Uh, okay, cool. Thanks, Storm. <laughs> so do you want to know the behind the scenes reasoning for that line? Go on. Explain to me why it's so terrible. <laughs> okay. So as I said, there were several iterations of this script, one of which was Joss Whedon. Mm-hmm. And Joss Whedon wrote a script and throughout it, Toad was making comments about Toads. So it was always say, do you know what happens when a Toad does this? You know, do you know what happens when a Toad jumps on top of you and stuff like that? And it was a repeated motif, supposedly. Okay. And so when that scene comes up later on and Storm's meant to say, do you know what happens to a Toad when it's struck by lightning? And then she's meant to sort of shrug, give her sort of well, the same thing that happens to everything else. A sort and then he gets of sarcastically sort of... Sarcastic throwaway yeah. line. Obviously, then several other scripts happened and all the bits setting up for that basically got cut out. And then you had Halle Berry, who's not the best actor in the world doing that. I mean, she's not terrible. She's, she's won an Oscar, for God's sake. Oh, yeah. But um, certainly a storm is not her finest performance. Uh, that would, of course, be Catwoman. <laughs> but... Um, One of my favourite films. She comes out of that elevator shaft all sort of righteous fury and bellowing the lines with like lightning around her and stuff. And it has no context for the rest of the film at that point. So it is a terrible line. In context, I would say it's a slightly less terrible line. (laughs) But do you reckon that if she did give a little bit of a sarcastic sort of tone to it, it would work. I think it needs the setup. It needs the okay. previous toad lines to say, you know, what is this joke about? Mm. It's a punchline without the setup. It's like her just coming out of that elevator shaft and going, to get to the other side, and then zapping <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, there are 
Well, this film I did feel was quite funny, but most of the bits that I laughed at was Logan's lines. You know, and there's the bit where he comes out after fighting Mystique and Scott's like, prove that's you. And he's like, you're a dick. Ah, oh, fair enough. That's fine. You know, and like, yeah. when he clips him off with his bit of claw. Yeah. These things are funny. I, d- I did go, huh. you know, I did do a little laugh. You gave a wry chuckle. Yeah. Yeah. I know. There's some, there's some moments in it that are quite good. You'd hope so with sort of 10 scripts, but yeah. <laughs> Just a few more things on this film then. We touched on this in our very first episode, but I don't get that when Mystique breaks into the X-Mansion and then into Cerebro, why he changes back into her true form. Yeah, don't make any sense. Surely the audience is smart enough to know it's her by the eye change. But why does her eyes change anyway? That's true. That keeps happening throughout the film. On the news, it happened. You know, She looks at the camera and yeah. her eyes turn yellow. It doesn't make any sense apart from for very slow audience members who go, why is Senator Kelly alive again? I thought he was dead. <laughs> I think that maybe in that scene when she does break into Cerebro, maybe have her as Bobby walk up and then change into Xavier and then a walking Xavier walks in. Yeah. Because then you go, oh, that must be Mystique. But the thing is, you've always got to remember there are very stupid people out there who perhaps wouldn't. They'd go, wait, can Iceman turn into a professor? Are they the same character? (laughs) Oh, it's Mystique. I see. No, it's the same reason they have to show her eyes glowing yellow for no apparent reason every so often, just to remind people. Was there anything that you didn't like about the film? Yeah, there's moments. There's moments. As I say, uh, Wolverine's sort of creepy courtship of Jean Grey. Well, talk about creepy... I think Sabretooth is a lot more creepier than Logan. Yeah, but he's a villain. We're not meant to like him. <laughs> yeah, but he's, he keeps asking Storm to scream for him in a very, very creepy... Yeah, I know, but that's deliberately creepy, though. Yeah, but it's a bit over the top. I will say Sabretooth in this is not a great character. I don't know why he keeps growling and roaring and making weird sounds. He's not anything like the Victor Creed we see in X-Men Origins Wolverine, who's a bit more of a, a nuanced character, perhaps, as nuanced as it gets for that film. And Toad's a lot cooler than he should, has any right to be from his comic appearance. He, he's oh, sort yeah. of doing cool thing but that just happens when you cast a stuntman like ray park to do the acting in it and gets to twirl around a stick like darth maul from time to time (laughs) one last point then that i'll say is something that i did like about the film the old bait and switch the fact that the film leads us to believe that magneto is after logan the mastery of metal is after the man of metal but actually it's rogue we learn it at the same time as the, the characters you say that though this is what bugged me right actually that's another thing i disliked is early in the film when they get to the x mansion i think it was scott says to professor x what did magneto want with him and charles says i'm not sure it was him that they were after oh yeah (laughs) charles then apparently completely forgets about that for the rest of the film until after rogue is taken and he goes i made a mistake i thought they were after you and it's like no you didn't you said about 20 minutes ago you said it's not you're not sure it's them you're after and the only other person there was rogue yeah all right i must have forgotten that yeah it it (laughs) bugged me when i was rewatching. my final question is why does rogue's hair change color uh because of magnetism oh okay fair enough no that answers that as you will learn from the comics, the more comics you read, you realise that magnetism is basically magic and it can do whatever the plot needs it to do at any point, as long as it's explained with magnetism. <laughs> I mean, I think that she could use some just for men or shall I say just for X-Men. Shall we move on to the comics? Okay. So I've already said that the film is not really based on any one particular comic book. Mm -hmm. So I've chosen X-Men Grand Designs to give you a crash course in X-Men history. Uh, So just going into it, what were your first impressions of this era of X-Men? Oh, it's so fast paced, but it works. First of all, actually, what I do want to say is the art style. It's very pop arty. You've got the little dots and yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, it's Ed Pisker's sort of self-taught style that he used for Hip Hop Family Tree, Mm -hmm. which is sort of a history of hip hop done in a comic book format. Um, Really good if you get a chance to read it. You're right about it being fast paced. It basically covers an issue of early X-Men per page, you know, just recapping these storylines. Did you keep up with it away with that storytelling? Yeah, I mean, it's very different to what we've read previously, Hmm. but I did enjoy the 
references to characters and to story arcs as well. Yeah. You've got so many names sprinkled in. I'm not going to sit here and list every name that's in there. But a couple that did stand out to me. Mm -hmm. You've got Dr. Kurt and Shannon Marco. Yep. Which as soon as I heard Marco, I was like, oh, I recognize that last name. It's Kane Marco, which then you go, oh, yeah, the juggernaut. Yeah. So I did like that they had that in there. Also, there's a character called David. Yeah. Which I recognize because of his spiky, tall hair. Him being Legion. Mm -hmm. Because I've watched the first season of Legion. I've not kept up with it, though. So it's something that I do want to go back to. Am I right in saying he's Charles's son? He is, yes. The TV series Legion is very good, by the way. So I would highly recommend mm. going back to first it. First season, mm. very, very good. Not sure why I stopped it, but it's something that I do want to go back to. Yeah, it's finished now. Um, it's three series and done. So, yeah. It's, uh, is it three? Yeah. Okay. And then also you've got the references to, you know, the Hellfire Club, mm -hmm. the Mutant Registration Act, yep. the Sentinels, mm -hmm. which we spoke about in Days of Future Past. Yep the savage lands mm -hmm. and also the coming of galactus yeah which again we covered that in fantastic four we did yeah so it was quite nice to read a different take on things that we've read previously yeah because there's a particular shot that i can remember when i think jeans left the x-men and she walks past and she sees silver surfer and galactus mm -hmm. at the baxter building and i know that story I know the exact sort of scene that's happening in. Yeah. It's quite nice to see a different perspective mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah. So those of you listening at home who don't know, the comic is basically a recapping of X-Men history. And the volume, uh, volume one that you read, is the sort of first team, the original five and then later Havoc and Polaris, who joined the team momentarily before the big revamp and the era that we've already read before, Storm and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it sort of consolidates a lot of X-Men history and tells it in a chronological fashion. So it takes things from all over X-Men history and then puts them in order in the timeline that in which they happened. It's not straight retelling though it consolidates elements for sort of narrative purposes so it combines juggernaut getting his powers with charles's mm -hmm. disability which is not in the comics mm -hmm. in the original comics anyway he's crippled by someone called lucifer who drops a rock on him and in fact lucifer turns up in the comic as well but um for those who don't know that is what this comic is attempting to do is, is retelling about 30 years of x-men history and putting it into a sort of order that makes sense which is why it's so fast-paced yeah but so it does work i don't feel that the characters that are left out i didn't feel confused at any point i mean there's characters i don't know yeah but it still worked i will say though there is something that's missed out it's something that we've talked about mm -hmm. before okay it's stevie hunter's saab turbo <laughs> she makes a fantastic return to this fantastic podcast <laughs> <laughs> well you know me I, i've always got that saab turbo on the brain <laughs> i'm saving up for the one day that i too can own one in that lovely purpley magenta color we should get a um, podcast <laughs> and drive around and flare out our amazing yep. podcast to people who don't want to listen. <laughs> and then we'll crash it when Colossus is attacking us. <laughs> but yeah, so apart from that, I mean, as I say, because it's a streamlining of telling those events as well, there are things that are, you know, certain concessions that are made to tighten things up. But like you say, I think it does mm -hmm. a good job in, in making it so reading for the first time. And this was actually my first time reading this, unlike all the other comics we've read. Ooh. Yeah, It isn't overly overwhelming or confusing. Well, for me anyway, because I knew about a lot of this stuff before, but by the sounds of it for you as well. There were a couple bits that, not so much confused, but it's explained a couple of panels afterwards, such as when we get introduced to Scott or Cyclops. Yep. And I thought, like, Jesus, he just sliced that guy in half. But you find out it's a hallucination. Yes, it's a, a hallucination caused by Mr. Sinister. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was saying about that is a plot line that would only emerge much later, you know, in our timeline. But Ed Piska has fitted it where it would go chronologically in the storyline. Mm -hmm. So obviously the 60s comic books were very much one and done. This is sort of making a greater storyline around that. There does appear to be a lot of deaths in this. I don't know if there was that many deaths in the 60s era and the 70s era i know the scott bit i've just said that was a hallucination but then i'm pretty sure that charles xavier kills jacko diamonds which by the way great name and i was gonna say they're not really her fault but it is her fault but she didn't necessarily kill him when gene makes larry trask think that he's mutating he then shoots himself yeah so she didn't kill him but him dying is a it's definitely yeah, her fault that's what <laughs> Yeah, no, that did happen. I think the Jack of Diamonds thing, I, I seem to remember it not being quite as implicit to be Charles Xavier's fault. I think that was a bit more 
him saying, you know, get off of there, you idiot, you're going to kill yourself, and then he doesn't. But yeah, there's definitely some ambiguity here. And likewise, I think Charles Xavier's death, is that did that happen in volume one or two? Where he gets his neck broken. Well, now you've ruined volume two for me. <laughs> when he gets changeling to pretend to be him. Anyway, it's a lot more graphic in this comic book than I think it was back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this can do, you know, being a, a relatively recent comic book. And also looking at it with hindsight can be a little more graphic with those things, but also a little more cohesive tying those storylines together. Yeah. I'm not sure if you realise this, but when they rescue Bobby from the police cell, the officer that arrests him looks a lot like Stan Lee. Oh, right. I didn't notice that. Actually. It's, it's the glasses and um, the white moustache. Oh, yeah. So he does. Yeah, no, he does look a lot like Stan Lee. So I don't know whether, like, these background characters or unknown characters that are just there, if they take inspiration from the writers or creators just to draw them. I don't know if that was on purpose, but I definitely saw him and thought, that's Stanley. It's definitely something artists do. Marvels uh, by Kurt Busiek does it a lot. The art by Alex Ross is quite realistic art, mm-hmm. and he used a lot of photo references to comic book artists and writers at the time, famous people, things like that. You know, so so it's definitely something they do. Okay. And then also in that same page, when they're leaving the police station and Professor X has control over literally the entire place and they're all sort of frozen. Yeah. That scene reminded me a lot of the scene in Jessica Jones um, with Purple Man. Yeah. And this ties into what you were saying about the film, that Charles, if he wanted to, could easily subjugate and terrorise and just force the change he wants to see in the world, Mm. much like the Purple Man does uh, in the comic books. You know, he uses it for completely self-serving means, which Charles doesn't. So for all his flaws, and Charles does have many flaws, I think you've got to remember he is relatively altruistic and conscientious with his powers, considering how powerful he is. Yeah. Regarding Charles's ex-mansion, then. Yeah. The defence level in that, I think is just too over the top <laughs> and very dangerous. Yeah. Because when the juggernaut breaks in, the three lines of defence are um, sleeping gas, yep. homing grenades, yep. and then a electric field. Yeah, the big three. Which, if that's just a random burglar, <laughs> they've killed him. Again, going back to the deaths. I assume this was the self-defence for juggernaut-related incidents. Uh, I think it's... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Fair, that makes sense. It, it being Charles's half-brother, he had prepared for this, or step-brother, he had prepared for this eventuality. <laughs> I just thought if just if a cat just somehow found its way in, dead. Yeah. If a burglar tried to get in to take their china, dead. Yeah. But then, you know, they wouldn't do it again. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I do think I, I seem to remember that issue where Juggernaut breaks in. And the first half of the issue is them going around laying the traps around the um, grounds and like digging okay. pits and things to stop him. That makes sense. Like what we've said, it is quite fast paced. So those kind of things, it won't include. Maybe if you read the actual story yeah. arc from the time, it explains it in more detail. Yeah, it does. I mean, basically they were one and dones and you could read them independently. So there definitely is more context, but it's not really an ongoing narrative between the comics of this era. So I think that's mm-hmm. what this comic book does quite well is combining those storylines into more of a plot line. Yeah. I assume you also read the... Well, towards the end of the book, you've got the first copy of X-Men. So yeah, in my issue, because I've got the omnibus here, I've got a whole bunch of stuff towards the end there. I've got um, X-Men number one, I've got giant size X-Men number one, and I've got Mm -hmm. X-Men 268, which are original art, but recolored in the same style as the rest of the book, Mm -hmm. which I think is a really nice touch. And it just gives you that contrast between, like you say, the original first issue with what ends up in this book. Yeah, so I assume you being you, you've read number one before yes going from reading volume one and then going back to issue one Mm. what was your take on the characters or xavier anything sort of like popped out to you well i mean in terms of the first issue obviously it is a very light-hearted frothy affair i mean it's very strange how at the end of it they're all greeted and welcomed by the military and they say oh well done and shake their hands despite supposedly being hated and feared (laughs) and they sort of defeat magneto in the original issue and he runs away whereas in ed pisker's version it explains that he's sort of tired and he's drained i think it was you know and that's the reason that he was so easily defeated i do like how at the end of that it shows the x-men coming together 
together and using their powers to become a team. Yeah, but it is a bit archetypal origin story. You, you've got the four guys sort of streaming into the room at the beginning of it and then introduction of additional girl member of the team. Uh, here's the token woman. Here comes yeah, the girl. exactly. Who yeah. doesn't have much of a personality <laughs> outside of that for many years, unfortunately. But yeah, it works well as an introductory story. I can see why it captured some imaginations, but obviously not many because the title was cancelled subsequently, mm. which is actually the end of this first volume is when it was cancelled and then reintroduced as giant size X-Men. And shortly after mm-hmm. that is when Chris Claremont took over and it became the behemoth we know today, which is yeah. where the introduction of Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler and all those characters came from. And Wolverine, yeah, I mean, of course. Number one does feel a little bit outdated. I mean, as you said, there's the token female character, yeah. which a lot of the sort of wording that's used towards her or when they're talking about her can come across as sexist. Yeah, in fact, the flashback in the comic we read already, it comes from issue one, doesn't it? You know, look at this. It does, yeah. Look at her face and the rest of her. Is that the line? Yeah. Your favourite. Well, I thought that that was Scott who said it, but it's actually Amy. Yeah. But anyway, that's still a horrible thing to say. <laughs> And then they almost got like perv on her as well. When she first puts on the X suit, they're like, oh, look at her. She feels that or something. Yeah, she looks like she was poured into that. And it's all all dodgy lies on that. (laughs) Yeah, among Stan Lee's strengths, writing women was not one of them. (laughs) Yeah, not the best. I don't know whether I like the Charles that we see in this issue either. Mm. He's very, very stern. Yeah. And he also grades them on their training, Mm. which I feel a little bit odd. You know, how do you get an A or B or a see like, yeah. well done you jumped over that thing well also the, hey. all of their training is completely different which seems a bit unfair i mean for many many decades all angel did was fly through hoops and avoid things in the air because that was what his power was so uh, yeah it seems odd that you then grade someone on the thing that you've designed for them to do <laughs> yeah. anyway reading these for the first time then how mm-hmm. good of an introduction do you think they were to the x-men of this era Oh, I think it worked really well. Hmm. It's a great comic to learn the history of the X-Men. Yeah. Actually, it does fly through things very quickly, but you don't miss out on that much. It's not like you put it down, you go, oh, that didn't end right, or they missed out this bit. It still flows together. But it's I would say it rushes through these things no quicker than reading a Wikipedia entry, which a lot of people do. They want to know the history hmm. of the X-Men, so they'll go read a Wikipedia entry, whereas you can pick up this comic. Uh, you can pick up the Omnibus edition here for about 50 quid. I don't know how much you're about 15, quid i think it's yeah know, yeah something like that and there's three like three volumes of yours in the omnibus and they'll tell you the history of the x-men and they'll rush through it but you will get a, a sense of the characters and the plot lines in a way that makes sense so i agree with you i think they make a really good entry level x-men read i think that i definitely take episode one and two as a whole and then you've got to take x-men number one at his own thing. I know it's been recolored and redesigned yeah. slightly, but different era, different sort of style. Oh yeah. I mean they're they're very much included as bonuses. Mm-hmm. You know, the, in all three of the volumes that you would buy the Treasury, the oversized editions, which are really nice, big you know, yeah. bigger than my one and mine's an omnibus which is already oversized it comes with an additional issue but those are just bonuses they're little yeah. additional things you can read they're little easter eggs if you Ooh. will and you know what that means cue the music Ian's, Ian's egg hunt Ian's, Ian's egg hunt Ian's, Ian's egg hunt I'm not yoking you Right, so this week to be honest, not that many in there that I can see <gasps> Um, I think okay. because, as we've already said, they're not trying to set up a sequel. So maybe they didn't sort of sprinkle as many Easter eggs in as they would normally. Yeah. First thing that I have to say is Stan Lee makes his first appearance in a Marvel movie. This is the first one, is it? All his previous appearances were in TV shows or made for TV films. Or more rats. Or more rats. For example, the trial of the Incredible Hulk from 1989. Mm-hmm. And also, in this film, it appears that he likes to have mustard on his hot dog. Hawkeye will be pleased. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. Next one. Speaking of appearances, the guy who drops off Rogue at the start of the film is actually played by George Boozer, who is the voice of Beast in X-Men, the animated series. That's good. And finally, the character of Henry Gyrich, which is Senator Kelly's aide. Yeah. He's obviously replaced by Mystique. And then Magneto says, Mr. Gyrich has been dead for some time. But if you listen closely right at the end of the film, there is a news broadcast that says that he was mauled by a bear. <laughs> so I take that to be that was Sabretooth. Yeah. 
It's a shame, really, because Henry Gyrick from the comic book is a more of a mainstream character. Mm -hmm. He sort of appears on and off quite a lot. He's sort of a general foil in the government for the Avengers and the X-Men. And yeah, he was very much written out very quickly in this. Yeah. But again, I suppose that's to do with the, the not planning sequels thing. But yeah. Is that all you got? Is that the Easter eggs for today? That's the Easter eggs. But also, what I'll do, Ooh. I'll fold in some foreshadowing. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Ironically, I was not prepared for this. <laughs> so, going back to that van, hmm. on the door of that van, it says Liberty, hmm. foreshadowing the end of the film. And then when Sabretooth walks into the layer they've got yeah toad is spray painting something green which we can't quite see what it is again that goes the end of the film and something that i did find interesting actually is when logan first meets charles on the blackboard there is a diagram that includes the radius of curvature and the focal plane which is then used later on by scott when Jean holds up his visor and he shoots it towards her face, but then it comes off at a curved angle and then hits Sabretooth. Okay, that's cool. One thing I did wonder about that Statue of Liberty scene is, did they have to remove the hand from the Statue of Liberty and put a new one on without anyone noticing? Yeah, I guess so, (laughs) which I don't know how that works. No, maybe just the torch top, but it's still not like that's going to go unnoticed, you would have thought. I I know the reason. Okay. Because... um, of magnetism <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go thank you very much for those tasty tasty eggs shall we get back to the film and comics and wrap things up yeah go on then so as you've already said this is the first time that you've read this particular comic did you enjoy it would you recommend it i really enjoyed it yeah i've read some of ed Pisker's stuff before uh with the first couple of volumes of um hip-hop family tree Mm-hmm. I really enjoy his style. I enjoy that sort of history, you know, storytelling device where it will recap things very quickly and explain ins and outs of these characters. And, you know, I think there's enough there for both people who are aware of these things and are fans of the comic books and new readers as well. But obviously, that would be on you to decide. But I think it does a really good job of condensing 30, 40 years of X Men history down to one easily digestible volume. What about you? What was your first impression? Yeah, I mean, exactly the same, pretty much. Obviously, I don't know the history as well as you do. Stuff that I've learned is online and watching clips on YouTube. But I came away from this thinking that was a good summary of their history. Yeah. It all made sense. There was no gaps that I was confused about or that I wanted to question. I would definitely recommend it especially for new readers and for old readers, yeah. really. Now that you've read that first volume, mm-hmm. are you considering picking up volumes two and three? Yeah, I think at some point it would be something that I want to read on. There's slowly a pile now of comics that I want to read uh, on top of what I've bought and not read. Not just for this podcast as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I'm really jealous of actually of your treasury editions. Those those oversized editions are so nice. I mean, my omnibus fits nicely on my shelf with my others, but having that extra size to look, appreciate all that art and, and there's quite a lot of text on some of those pages. So having that would be really nice. Yeah. Regarding the film then. Yeah. I mean, I'd be surprised if anyone hasn't seen the first one. Well, you've got to you've got to think, actually, it's 20 years old now. There's probably listeners to this podcast who are driving now who were born after this film came about. <laughs> so you've got to remember that there's a lot of people who probably didn't grow up with this and perhaps haven't watched it so yeah. maybe their first interaction with the x-men on screen was the sort of first class films hmm. yeah well also the popularity of the mcu in popular culture overshadows a lot of other things you know you forget there is a time before the mcu where these are the comic book films that we all watched and listened to so and there might even be a whole generation of people who never seen this film so would you recommend it to them I would. It's one of the best of the X-Men films. I reckon it's a good starting point. Even if you were to watch this and then not watch the rest of the X-Men films, it still does a good job. As you said, it's a good contained plot. How about you? Yeah, no, absolutely agree. It works perfectly well as a standalone film. It is one of my either top two or top three X-Men films. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I would definitely put it up there uh, as one of the better ones. And it has a hard job of introducing... 10 different characters to the audience and explaining powers and this new world and making it make sense to people and i think it does a really good job with that all things considered you know a couple of missteps and a couple of budget constraints involved but generally speaking i think what it does it does very well Mm -hmm. 
I actually picked up a card game of X-Men. Okay. And what came inside the box was a comic which takes place after this film. I've read it. I'm not going to talk about it now, but I think I'll pop it around to you. Okay. You can read it, and then we can talk about it in the next episode. Sounds good. It's a date. I'll write it in my diary. (laughs) (laughs) So, as you said, there's probably people that haven't watched these films and only used to seeing the MCU films. So, should we talk about how we would bring the X-Men into the MCU? Sounds good. So, we're not doing Ask the Teapot this week, and indeed this month. No, for X month we have a special segment lined up which we currently don't have a title for. I'm workshopping some titles as we speak. I've come up with hypothetical. <laughs> what would MCU do? Or get away from her MCU pitch. That's an alien reference that doesn't really line up with X-Men or, or Marvel, <laughs> but they do own Alien now, so <laughs> out of those 3, probably I'd say what would MC you do right, we'll go with that then so what would mc <laughs> you do welcome uh this is the part of the show where we are going to pitch our own ideas for how we would ingratiate the x-men within to the mcu obviously we all know it's coming somewhere down the line they've already announced fantastic four and as such x-men is coming so this episode we are going to start with the first x-men film in a brand new series and explain how we would do it Ian, let's start with you. So first of all, the team themselves. What characters would you include in your starting lineup and why? My team would obviously include Xavier. Mm -hmm. It being the X-Men, you kind of have to have him in. But I think I would go for the original five. Okay. So Jean Grey, Iceman, Cyclops, Beast and Angel. So it's quite a white cast (laughs) and one that's very male driven. Uh, would you make any changes to the, the casting lineup to accommodate for that, or would you be looking to cast close to him? Yeah, regarding the cast, I have no issues with casting people of other races. I don't think any of those characters have to be white, in my opinion. So what I'm getting at, really, is can we cast Dev Patel as Cyclops? <laughs> Sure, why not? Is that the sort of age range you wanted to go for? Were you looking to go early 20s? What sort of age would you cast that? Well, when we get towards my plot, I think that's something that we can probably discuss together to fit in with my storyline. Okay, sounds good. So next up, Marvel Studios, they're known for having a strong supporting cast of characters. Often they'll have acclaimed actors in smaller roles like Tommy Lee Jones in Captain America, Forrest Whitaker in Black Panther, Marissa Tomei in Spider-Man. So who would your supporting cast be? I think both of my choices have been abused a little bit, but I think the way that I've structured this, it makes sense. Mm. So I would use Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury. Okay. And also I would bring back Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Interesting. So we'll see when this is set. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so often with their franchises, uh, Marvel will start with a villain who is tied to the hero's backstory or a reflection of the hero themselves, sometimes with the same powers. Think Yellow Jacket in Ant-Man or Iron Monger in the first Iron Man, uh, Caecilius in Doctor Strange or Yon Rog in Captain Marvel. This means they don't have to focus too much on the villain at the expense of the hero. So with that in mind, what villain are you going for? So this may surprise you, mm. but the villain of this particular film that I'm pitching yeah. is the humans. Okay. So human race as a character. As a character. Would there be a central antagonist, a leadership of that? Because obviously there are quite a few villainous humans in the comic books. Yeah, I think this is when you've got more of a range to choose from because you've read more than me. So once you've heard my pitch, maybe you can give me some ideas. Sounds good. Right, well, in that case, let's go for the pitch. What is your pitch for X-Men in the MCU? So I'm thinking we start off with a news broadcast Mm -hmm. showing that Tony Stark had sacrificed himself to save the world. The camera then pans for us and we see a bold man sat in a wheelchair. Obviously, it's Professor X. Mm -hmm. He then thinks at this point that it's time for the X-Men to go public. This catches the attention of Nick Fury. Mm -hmm. so they have to meet so charles and fury have a conversation where charles explains that the mutants have been around for some time and they've not really been helping out they've not been joining the fight this is when we have a flashback to i'm not too sure the timeline this is when i'm a little bit mm, not sure okay either the 80s or the 90s so this is when they all first met the original five how they met 
Charles and how they joined him and they made the X-Men. Yeah. So there was a brief point in time when they first met, they did try to help and came out and did fight. This next bit will be the main part of the film. This is when the humans become the villainous character of the story, when they don't like mutants, they're scared of their powers. Again, with the time frame of the MCU, yeah. in the 80s or the 90s, there was no superheroes flying around. Yeah, so you would set this as a period piece akin to Captain America the First Avenger or Captain Marvel? Yeah. So because of all of the issues, Charles then stops sending out the X-Men and he wipes the minds of the humans. So they then don't know the X-Men are there. Mm. Also, at this point in time, Charles has no funding. So the school was pretty run down. And from the outside, it, it just appears to be a school rather than its home of the X-Men. Yeah. The story then moves towards the start of the MCU. Yeah. So I would say this bit's based after Iron Man 1, before the Avengers. So we are jumping ahead sort of 20 to 30 years. Yeah. Okay. So this is when Xavier meets Tony Stark. Yeah. He agrees to fund Xavier's school for the gifted... Youngsters. Thank you. So this is why when Xavier sees the news, he chooses to come out because the guy who helped him create the X-Men, he feels it's his duty to come out. I see. So since they were funded, they've been doing improvements to the school. Mm -hmm. He builds Cerebro. He builds the Danger Room. And we then see the characters then training and they start to understand and have more control over their powers. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. I don't know the main sort of plot, if you will, of the flashback, but that would be the main story. Okay, right. So, I mean, in terms of villains then, obviously you haven't got a central antagonist in particular. You're saying humans mm. are general. I mean, obviously the X-Men have had various human villains. Mm -hmm. The Purifiers are a group of human villains. There's Senator Kelly, obviously, Bolivar Trask, and William Stryker from the, the X-Men films mm -hmm. as well. So some human villains that could appear there. But what would the... You've said, obviously, it's them building up and training, but you're saying you, you need some sort of 80s, 90s plot plot line there a reason for which they are hiding yeah so i thought that rather than going back to the 60s or the 50s like we have done in first class yeah i thought we do kind of need to bring it forwards a bit mm. because of the mcu is now 2020 2025 because of the five-year jump yeah so i don't want these people to be too old you know if it was in the 90s the main five would be sort of in late 30s i guess uh, it depends what, what age they were in the, the 90s if they were teenagers in the 90s they're probably going to be in their 40s now yeah i would say have it set in the 90s then okay because then you know they'd be in their sort of 40s which again is a reasonable age especially if you do take care of yourself they should be able to still <laughs> do their job <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's your plot so last question then Marvel films famous for having an after credit sequence mm -hmm. setting up the future of that universe. What would be your after credit sequence? So, as I said, it's all a flashback. Mm -hmm. So, at the end of the film, Fury invites other people into the room. So, we see Doctor Strange, Reed Richards, yep. and we see a third character, but he's silhouetted. Mm -hmm. All we see of him is his pointy ears. Yep. So, that's what he's pointing towards Namor. Yeah. And either Fury says, I think it's time that you all met, or Reed says something like, we have to talk. So it's setting up the um, Illuminati. Okay, interesting. And we will cover subsequent films in our next two episodes of X-Month. So, we've done mine then. Mm -hmm. Who would your team be? I've got a similar lineup to you, actually, a five-man starting team. Mm -hmm. I have gone for a little bit more diverse, but not much, unfortunately. So I've got Cyclops, I've got Storm, Jean Grey, Iceman, and I've got Colossus, question mark. Mm -hmm. Basically, I've come up with this structure of these four main characters, and then I, I needed a fifth character. I feel like other people could fill that role, but for the villain I've chosen, I felt Colossus would be the best. Okay. I know you're not a fan of fan casting, mm. but any particular actors that you would want to play your team? Yeah, Dev Patel is going to be playing all like five that. characters Big Mama's House style. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so supporting cast. So supporting cast, I thought I wanted to treat the school like a faculty. And part of my setup was having the school under construction. So I, I was thinking Hank McCoy, pre-Beast, mm -hmm. could be a scientific advisor there. I would also have Professor X as a supporting character as opposed to being a main character in the film. Okay. I would have Moira McTaggart as a Scottish uh, lab researcher on Muir Island. Mm -hmm. 
Stevie Hunter and her Saab Turbo. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and also Opal Tanaka as Iceman's at first love interest, then becoming good friend and confidant. Uh, sort of her Ned Leeds to his Spider-Man. Okay, nice. So you've got a larger, sort of more fleshed out supporting cast. Yeah, I mean, that is what I'm hoping, is that if you had a smaller central X-Men cast, you could then focus more on those characters whilst fleshing out the rest of the cast with smaller roles, Mm -hmm. which is why I've relegated Professor X to a supporting role as opposed to a main role. He's sort of your Nick Fury to your Avengers as opposed to being a main character. Okay, and your big bad then who's your villain so as i said before i've picked someone who would not take too much limelight away from the main characters i think you need to establish the heroes in the first film Mm -hmm. so i've chosen a villain who seems quite route one uh he's a mutant he is very powerful he's very dangerous but his motivations are very much self-preservation i would go with proteus who is moira mctaggart's son in the comic book i don't know if you know much about proteus i don't know his ability is he will take on hosts he can take over people's bodies which will fuel him as energy but it will inevitably burn them out he will destroy them okay so he is a very dangerous mutant but he can sort of body hop okay so yes he would be my villain for the very good reason so your pitch then how would you work these characters into the mcu so we've actually gone for a quite similar route in terms of setup. I believe that, yeah, Professor X, Charles Xavier, has been hiding mutants from the greater world for a long time. Mm-hmm. He has been erasing people's memories where necessary, etc. And I would actually set this during the five-year snap, the gap between Endgame and Infinity War. Yeah. No. The reason being, it would be a time of greater discord. Things seemed a lot bleaker. You know, there were a lot of people missing, a lot of death, destruction caused by the snap. And as such, the world is a more dangerous place, but also a place in need of heroes. I would have Bobby Drake as our introductory character, slash your sort of audience surrogate. Mm -hmm. So sort of Spider-Man age, so 18, around that sort of young age. He's sort of coming to terms with his Mm -hmm. sexuality. He's on a date with a young woman, Opal Tanaka, in this instance. He is, at this point, very much still in the closet. Mm -hmm. He is being bullied by a chap who attacks him on the street, and he lashes out and freezes him, causing permanent damage to the man at this point an angry mob assails him Mm -hmm. there's a you know aggression in the street people are confused they're scared they're angry this is facilitated by the fact that we are in this dangerous time following the snap so they attack him he is rescued Mm -hmm. he is rescued by scott summers he is then brought back to the x mansion still under construction we see various faculty members who are going to be working there when it's up and running but this is very much early days he has introduced professor x at this point and we establish that Scott Summers is the first recruit of mutants to this new team. As I say, Xavier has known about mutants for some time, but is only just putting together a team because of a lack of heroes. You know, 50% of the world's heroes have disappeared, as well as 50% of all people, and people need heroes more than ever. Okay. So they begin recruiting. Mm-hmm. Jean Grey turns up at the school, much like her first comic appearance shortly after that, and we are introduced to her as a character. We then have uh, sequences involving recruiting people around the world. So we have a, a, an expedition to Africa where we meet and introduce Storm. Some action adventure stuff happens and we end up on Muir Island, Moira McTaggart established earlier. Mm -hmm. It's at this point where we start to establish the villain. Moira McTaggart is mother to Proteus. He is a very dangerous mutant who is kept encased within metal and a cage for his own and other people's well-being. It's a scientific research facility, this. I might even include someone like Jamie Maddox, who is multiple man, as her assistant, as he was in the comics. Mm -hmm. They find out about another mutant they travelled to Russia to recruit Colossus. He is out working the fields. A tractor comes off its bearings, it careens down the field, and Colossus, in a desperate act, shelters his young sister. Tractor hits him, and he turns to metal form and destroys the tractor, much like he does in his first comic book appearance. The X-Men arrive, as do the Russian government. Mm -hmm. There is a fight, a showdown between the two, perhaps even introducing the Winter Guard, the Russian superhero team, in which the X-Men face off with them before getting away and returning to Muir Island. However, whilst they've been away, we have been party to an escape of Proteus. He takes over the boat captain, who has been shepherding people back and forth to the island, and when he's on the mainland, he begins to jump between people, and he kills a lot of people, and he kills them very publicly. Okay. So this is 
out there in the world. It's on the news about this person. The X-Men return to Muir Island. They show down with Proteus. And ultimately, this gentle giant, this painter, this artist, this peaceful man, Colossus, his ability is to turn into metal, is the only one who can ultimately kill the villain whose vulnerability is to metal. But the problem with this is all very public. So ultimately, whilst they have stopped Proteus from causing any further damage, they have exposed mutants to the greater world in a point that uh, Xavier can no longer cover up. But also explaining why a world that is already on the brink of fear would hate and fear new superheroes as opposed to thinking they're just the new Avengers. Yep. So that would be my sort of pitch. Ultimately, it would end with them returning to the expansion, which is now set up as a facility. Okay. So they don't capture... Proteus? No, I mean, Proteus in the comics, his, his weakness is metal, which is why he can be contained within a metal cell, which is why I think Colossus, in terms of the final recruit, this gentle giant, this peaceful character, being the one to ultimately have to make the sacrifice and kill him, so it would be a Pyrrhic victory. They have won, but there have been sacrifices, largely Colossus's innocence, in okay. a way. So I do have a question, Yeah. but I'll wait until after your post credit scene, in case it is answered in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving on to then, what would that be? I would attempt to establish further villains. I would try and build up to a Thanos-like threat for the mm-hmm. X-Men. And I think there is only one major villain that you can... Toad. That's the one. <laughs> um, funnily enough, I was thinking that. I was thinking an end credit sequence that would focus on someone like Toad, a young boy in London, establishing his powers, mm-hmm. but not being discovered by Xavier, instead being discovered by an alternative source, a man in magenta, who you do not see the face of in this one. We'll get onto this. He would not be the antagonist of my next film, but he would be mm-hmm. setting up for somewhere down the line. So... Almost like a a Nick Fury role in Iron Man when he's like, I'm putting together a team. So the same sort of thing, but with its villains. And you don't sort of see who it is. You sort of assume. Exactly. Okay. So my question then wasn't answered. You said that obviously you've got Professor X and Moira. Yep. Are they as close as they are in the comics and the previous films? There would certainly be uh, hints of a previous relationship there, yes. So then by one of Charles' X-Men killing her son, does that build friction with Charles and Moira? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, this would have an impact going forward on all of the characters involved. Certainly Colossus, who's the first time he's had to do something along these lines, but I would have had Moira be a, a welcoming figure on Muir Island. I would have probably set about half the film on Muir Island and had her be a sort of mentor as much as Professor Xavier was. And then obviously, ultimately, the need to defeat that enemy and to kill him rather than trying to recontain him, I'd say is what drives a rift between them. Okay, yeah. Which could use for drama in subsequent films. Yeah, really good. I think we've both gone different ways, Mm. but the idea that we've got mutants already established. Yeah. There is like a sort of fan theory out there that the snap caused the mutation. Yes. I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of it either, and I don't like it because I think it rules out characters like Magneto's backstory with regards to his Jewish uh, concentration camp history. Mm -hmm. Also rules out characters like Apocalypse, etc. So I like having history to my characters. It would also mean that all of the characters would have to be about five, surely. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Or they only became mutants very late in life. So I prefer the idea of having mutants have been around and present, but kept hidden. Yeah, I think that's also what I've gone for as well there. So that's our thoughts, but let us know yours. What would you want to see from the MCU X-Men? And if you want to find out what our future thoughts are about our second film, then do tune in next episode. And that's all from us. I hope you found this episode exciting. I I did, thank you. Not you. Oh. If you enjoyed X-Men Grand Design, then as mentioned, there are two further volumes that we didn't discuss here, which retell the X-Men's exploits of the 80s and 90s, both by Ed Pisker. And on the subject of Ed Pisker, Hip Hop Family Tree, which chronicles the early days of hip hop culture, is definitely worth checking out if you think that's something you might be into. Ask the Teapot may be taking a break for X month, but it will return and we will need your questions. You can email them to becometheteapot at hotmail.com or tweet us at becometheteapod. Next episode, X-Month continues with, yes, you guessed it, 2003's X-Men 2, or X2 if you're feeling lazy, or X2 X-Men United if you're a fan of subtitles and like your films to sound like football teams.
For this, we'll be revisiting the works of Chris Claremont with the original graphic novel God Loves, Man Kills, first published in 1982. Until then, stay safe, keep reading comics, and we hope to see you next time. Bye. Did that come? Mm.